Can I welcome you to the 15th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee and remind everyone to put any electronic devices onto silent mode for the duration of the meeting. The first agenda item is consideration of whether to take a number of items of business in private, specifically the review of evidence on the work programme at today's meeting and the reviews of evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on the budget and also separately on the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry at our next meeting. Have we agreed? Thank you. The second item of business is a session on the role of education authorities. The committee agreed to undertake this session following its overview sessions, which emphasised the central role of education authorities in delivering policies in relation to childcare and education. And I welcome to the meeting Councillor Stephanie Primrose, Education, Children and Young People spokesperson, and Jane O'Donnell, Chief Officer of COSLA, Councillor Jacqueline Henry, Chair of young, Children and Young People Thematic Board, and Peter McLeod, Director of Children's Services, Renfrewshire. Council Scottish Local Government Partnership. Welcome. I understand uh, both councillors wish to make a short opening statement. Uh, can I start with yourself, councillor? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and good morning. COSLA is pleased to be invited to attend this session of the Education Skills Committee. COSLA represents 28 of the 32 local authorities in Scotland, and I am the spokesperson for children and young people. My remit covers school based education early years, children's health and well-being, social care for families and young people, and youth employment and positive destinations. This is important because it reflects how we work as local authorities. Councils play a fundamental role in the lives of children and young people in Scotland, and our role as education authority is only one aspect of the role, bound with wider responsibilities for children's and family services and underpinned by GERFEC. This works particularly for the families and young people under most stress at the moment. They need a wide range of services to support them in every aspect of their lives. You will hear me say often that they cannot mitigate against the real impact of poverty and chaotic lives in a classroom alone. Councils are uniquely placed to bring together a range of committed public service professionals to support families and communities. There has been a lot of media coverage of the Scottish Government's Education Delivery Plan and Education Governance Review. COSLA has agreed our response. And we'll make that available to you as soon as possible. There's a couple of tweaks, so it's not publicly available at the moment, but it will be published as soon as possible. I am, however, happy to discuss with you the detail today. We recognise concern voiced elsewhere about the leading nature of the questions and have therefore provided a response which focuses on the key principles and issues under discussion. We hope this is accessible to everyone and encourage others to join the debate. If we consider our principles, there is much we agree upon. The devil is in the detail and real, the real systematic change we have seen over recent years risk being derailed without an evidence base for change. We agree that we need to close the attainment gap, we would widen this further than those experience poverty and deprivation. We agree that our workforce is a committed, talented and valuable asset to Scotland. We believe that councils support the workforce in providing a strategic support and locate elected scrutiny to delivery of services and to ensure the quality that communities expect and need is there. We again agree that the parental voice is important and the achievement of positive outcomes for young people. We know that we need to encourage those who feel disengaged to come forward to achieve equality. We agree with the Christie Commission principles of prevention and early intervention and we therefore note the importance of quality early learning and play to offset the attainment gap which can exist by primary one rather than require a classroom teacher to fix all the problems that exist. Further, we support Further, the support we can put around families in pregnancy and early infancy, which is delivered by social care colleagues in partnership with health. Because I have agreed a cross-party position in relation to the Education Delivery Plan and Governance Review, and this consensus is further supported by meaningful dialogue and engagement with our lo wider local government family. And I look forward to the discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Henry, do you have a comment you'd like to make? Um, just a very brief statement, and first of all, just for clarity, I'm actually convener of Education and Children Policy Board. The thematic board is a community planning committee of, of uh, the Community Planning Partnership in Renfrewshire. Really, I just want to um, align myself and the Scottish Local Government Partnership with many of the remarks made by Councillor Primrose. Um, we, the Scottish Local Government Partnership um, represents a significant number of the population or size of population in Scotland and as such a significant number of children. Um, as with COSLA, we have, we see education firmly within the wider 
children's services, um, underpinned by GERFEC, and we would like to discuss more of that today with you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, before I begin the questions, I'd, I'd just like to say thank you to Hill Park Secondary for the, uh, taking the time for the, to allow me to visit them on Friday. Uh, I met with senior management team, pupils and teachers and found it very useful and uh, got some very interesting responses to some of the questions I had. One of the things that was quite clear was the importance of collaboration between some of the local schools and, and the local um, integration groups, I think, that they're called in Glasgow, uh, which they, when they work, they work, as was kind of like what came across from there, but there still was a fair bit of work to be done to make sure that the relationship was as strong as it could be, but it's clearly a very important thing. Working together collaboratively, I thought, was one of the things that came across loud and clear. Also, the importance of strong leadership within the school, which, in this case, um, the school seemed to think that they had both in this head teacher and the previous head teacher, so that was very encouraging. Uh, my question will not surprise Councillor Primrose in particular that uh, I'm going back to the funding on the early years issue. We, we did say the last, the last time that Councillor Primrose was in front of us that um, there was clearly, clearly quite a gap between what the Scottish Government had said that the local authorities had received for funding early years. Uh, and what uh, was, appeared to have been spent. From further correspondence, there was uh, another 40, 40, 50 million was made available, um, but there still seemed to be a gap of something like 86 million pounds, which the, the councils didn't seem to be able to uh, tell us where it was uh, in terms of the early year spending, although they claim that it has been spent on that. So I wonder if we've got any further on finding out where that money has been spent or if it's been put aside to be spent uh, in the near future? Thank you very much. And that has come out come as no surprise. Um, I, I think to start off with, very early on in these discussions, uh, both myself and, and my colleagues at COSLA met with the Minister. I, we've had this discussion at, at this committee before. And at that early meeting with, with the Minister, you know, we expressed concern that it was only one local uh, financial return that was being assessed. And at that point in time, we said, you know, really, that does not encompass the whole spend in early years. A, a lot of the referrals, for example, for our vulnerable two-year-olds have come through a social work referral, which would mean that that LFR had not been represented within this. So we, we started off the, the discussion with, with Scottish Government on a basis that they had not provided the full, the full spend. It's certainly my own authority. I've shared this with you before, we had at least three LFRs that came into play, and again, it was only assessed on one. So to start off with you, I think we, we had a, a debate on the figures. I think we have to accept a couple of things, that the, the actual introduction of 600 hours has been very, very successful. There was a recent survey done, and 97% of people who, well, parents or carers using that, said the service was either good or very good. So you know, I think local government has delivered a very, very good service. I think as well, I know the parent forum have come in and they've said that it's not flexible enough, they're still looking for flexibility. And we have said what we're going to do, we have got our 600 hours in, I think we've done it very well, and what we're going to do now is build on that flexibility. In order to do the, the building on the flexibility, we have to accept that there's a lot of groundwork still to do. We still have to get more people in place, we still have to get our buildings out of the ground. And I had a very long discussion with one of our finance officers, and he said you know, a lot of the money is still sitting in the uncommitted balances. So if you think about it, I mean... Yeah. It's sitting in, un in uncommitted balances. Uh, and what wasn't mentioned there was that COSLA was part of the, the group that signed off on these figures. Mm -hmm. So clearly, COSLA may well have had some concerns at the beginning of the, the conversation, but they signed off on those figures, uh, along with the ministers. Where is this £86 million in uh, these uncommitted balances, and why wasn't it recorded? Why, wasn't it, uh, why didn't you say, either at the initial meeting or in further correspondence, or even when the government were coming out with these figures, well, how couldn't COSLA at that point say, I accept there's two different groups now, that we, our, our share of that is this, and this is where it is? I, I, I wasn't on shift at that point in time. I will pass over to Jane. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Chair. I think um, it's important to say that all during the discussions at an official level, we had advised our colleagues in the Scottish Government that actually the single LFR would, would be unhelpful and it wouldn't encompass the large amount of spend. 
and that that position wasn't wasn't agreed and wasn't taken forward. So at the point of the the report being published, cause officer had never agreed that that was the figure that should go forward. We had always had the position that you did agree the report. You did you did agree you did sign up with the count, the, the government. On the, the financial return, yes. but at every point we mentioned that these figures weren't weren't accurate. We said that the spend is elsewhere. Well, why would you have signed it off then? If, if 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 the government are claiming that you have got a hundred and thirty-five million black hole uh, in early years, why would you have signed that off? Why would you not have made it very clear at that point that you may well accept the generality of it, but you're not willing to accept that because it makes your local authorities look as if they're not doing their job properly? And I think to, to be in, in clear that COSLA did take that position, which was we accepted the generality of the report, but we did not accept the LFR return. And apologies if that has not been made clear no, to you. it's not made clear to anyone. Um, we're, we're happy to be clear on that now. I think also Absolutely. just to support, in, in addition to what Councillor Primrose has said, at the point at which we agreed that we we're going to do the 600 hours provision, and I would agree it's, it is a real good news story between Scottish government yes, and local absolutely. government. Absolutely. Something really ma marvellous has happened here. Um, it wasn't ring-fenced. And this was because a number of local authorities had already started the spend, and some of my colleagues here um, will be able to give you some detail on that. They'd already started spend in early years. So they had taken some of that money to, to mitigate against the spend they'd already made. And also, we agreed with the government that the important thing is to get the 600 hours in a very tight timescale. I think we had about eight months to do it. Again, successful because we did it, but the flexibility would come online later on, and hopefully that's what you've started to see. And I believe that my colleagues did send a report to the committee on the 20th of October. It's given you an idea, when we spoke to our member council, some of the areas they feel they're building on the flexibility, and I hope that's been made available to you. Happy again to go into that. And again, my colleagues in Renfrewshire maybe have, have some ideas as well. Sorry. Yes, if I could just give you one example from the Renfrewshire part of the Scottish Local Government Partnership. Uh, the total expenditure area, learning and childcare of just under £14 million, the grant that we got, um, what happened was that our quoted figure of, of uncommitted expenditure was a, a million pounds, just uh, um, just, just under a, a quarter of the, the total allocation. And uh, just as Jane has uh, indicated, what we did with uh, the, the money was, in effect, we'd already committed to the expansion of early learning and childcare before the grant funding became available. So it was not a question of underspending the grant funding. It was a fact. The fact was that the commitment had already been made was be and was being delivered by Renfrewshire. Renfrewshire in the context of the policy, had also taken some very early steps in expanding different uh, models of, of early learning and childcare. And one model in particular, uh, led by Councillor Henry, was uh, Families First, which has subsequently been evaluated by Glasgow University as being one of the most positive uh, programmes implemented in Scotland to date. So our position would be very clear, and that is that we had already committed expenditure before the grant funding was made available. It was not a question of underspend. It was, in effect, in effect a recognition that, as a local authority, we had taken early steps to put in place the measures that the policy then indicated we should subsequently uh, put in place through the funding mechanism. Uh, so that would be one example from Renfrewshire's point of view of how we had already uh, put in place the measures that were then subsequently funded through uh, the grant that became uh, available. Although that's, that's suggesting to me that, that what you're saying is that if we have done something in the past and then we're given something to do in the future, we should be allowed to say that we've done it in the past and we'll just keep the money. I'm not sure necessarily that that's what we are saying. I think that what I'm indicating is a recognition that some authorities had already moved before the policy was implemented, before the grant funding became available. And, and I suppose, as my colleague Jane has indicated, um, because of the ring fencing issue that she's, uh, she's already pointed out to the committee, and the fact that the needs of these young people spread across different uh, categories of service. My service, for example, is an integrated children's service with children's social work. Clearly, our health partners play a significant role in the provision of services to all, particularly those with additional needs in early learning and childcare. So uh, what I suppose I'm indicating is that um, we use the money to the best effect based, based on the needs of our local population and our analysis of it. So I don't think it was a question of keeping the money uh, to, to do something that was not in line with the policy. It was in recognition that we'd already indicated the need and were meeting uh, the provisions that the policy subsequently uh, uh, put the grant in place for. Yeah, I, I don't want to hog this meeting, but you've given money for a specific purpose uh, and then 
the local authorities can't seem to justify that they've spent it on a specific purpose. And one of the problems I had, which is probably more an issue for COSLA because COSLA has got more local authorities there, is that when I, I had asked originally if there was anybody that oversees the money that comes in from government that is for specific subjects such, uh, such as this at local authority level, the answer I suspect, we never really got the clear answer, but the answer seems to be no that uh, that money comes into local authorities. COSLA doesn't know how much each local authority is spending on it. So therefore, COSLA really shouldn't have been taking a position on it because it should have been for each local authority at that point. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I would suggest the, the best thing to be doing here is that there is some kind of monitoring exercise through COSLA to make sure that the local authorities that they're responsible for are doing what they are meant to be doing in terms of the, the money that the government's given them or else not make a public comment because they don't really know the facts. I, I think there's a, there's a fundamental issue here and that I represent 28 local authorities. So I represent them, I do not police them. So you, we could... Making statements saying that well, we are confident that the local authorities have done this when you can't possibly back that up in fact because you're not, as you say, policing them. Well, your local authorities come in to us and tell us what they have done. So, you know, I, because we can't go and police them, we need to just take that uh, as you know evidence. You, you, I can't. I don't have the authority to go back and ask 28 local authorities for their budget lines. No, 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 should I? No, should I? I, I, I? Yes. Okay. Sorry, Jane Adorno, you want to come? Well, and it was just to support what Councillor Prim was, was saying. I think what we had suggested as officials at the point of this uh, financial report being pulled together was that we would have been more than happy to have done a bit of that work, which would have allowed us to do a little bit of the, the monitoring and, and identifying where the baseline position is. It's a way we've worked in the past with Scottish Government, and it's actually been very successful because we link very much in with our professional colleagues like directors of finance, directors of education, children's services, and therefore we can get a sense of what's going on and identify if there are things that on a national basis, local government should be looking at. Unfortunately, we didn't get the opportunity to do that this time, but I think we're willing to consider it in the future in terms of just having a look at how that money is spent in order to be accountable and transparent. OK, I, I'm going to move on now. If, if you don't, right, yes, OK, Councillor. Last point, and it's, I think, yeah. a, a, an issue that I'm sure we'll share. I have, I, as we do at COSL, we have concerns about the, the uptake of the vulnerable two-year-olds. Oh. Um, I, I was in discussions with the previous CAPSEC about this, and I think across Scotland, and I will stand correct in these statistics, I think the uptake was around about 25%. And my own authority was 33 and, and that was seen as good. So I think we have some work to do to tackle the, the families surrounding those vulnerable two-year-olds. You know, we all share this commitment to early intervention. And I think we do need to, to drill further into why a vulnerable two-year-old take-up is not perhaps where it should be. And I think, I think that's the thing we have to share. Certainly anecdotally, uh, some of the things I'm coming, that are coming back to me is that we've not been clear enough about the link with DWP. You know, a lot of parents are very worried that there's a link to their actual benefits. So you know, if they come forward, if they get a job, if you know, their child's not performing or whatever, somehow that will affect their benefits. So I think that's a point I would like to raise about, about that. Get the opportunity uh, through the question as well. So just before I finish, we haven't figured out where the £86 million is, uh, but I do want to congratulate the local authorities on all the good work they've done to make sure that this £600 has been achieved. Uh, Ross Thompson. Um, in, in, in a submission to the committee, we hear from fair funding um, for our kids, um, and in that they, they talk about the expansion of childcare from 600 hours to the 1140. Um, in the submission, um, and I'll quote it, they have worked out that even if councils used every single space to, apologies, my voice is going, <clears throat> um, if they had uh, work, used every single space to deliver the promise of 1,143 hours by the end of 2020, Scotland would still be 26,000 places short with an average of 40 children in a nursery. This means 650 new nurseries minimum. Um, just to ask both COSLA and the Scottish Government Local Partnership if this is an estimate that you both agree with. Uh, we would not be in a position to agree with that. We, we would need to have further uh, reference back to I don't know where their figures have come from. Mm. But you know, I know that the fair funding issue has been coming up, and I think I've maybe mentioned it earlier, that you know, we do still need to build in flexibility. And I think you know, we have our 600 hours, which I think has been delivered very, very well. And I think it really... I, I'm going to go on about it, but it really bites into what we're trying to do. And I think 
increasingly we're going to build in flexibility to our 600 hours and we do need to build the flexibility into 1140 hours and a plea I would make here and now is that we need to get on with that um, you know, I, I think I, I know Mr Scott asked me this before you know, am I concerned about the workforce? Am I concerned about the about the pace of the 1140 hours? And actually, I think I maybe uh, didn't quite answer his question, but I think that we really now need to get get on to that. We need a blended approach. We need to get our young people trained. We need to get older people back into the workforce. So I think the issue of 1140, 1140 hours and flexibility is one that we really need to drill into. Sorry, in my council, we need to keep touching, <laughs> uh, the, pressing the, the consul if we want to speak. Um, I would agree that we don't know where the figures are from, so I can't really comment on those figures. Um, I should perhaps set the context that for 38 years I, before I came into this post, I was an early year specialist. Um, in terms of, of working in education at both local and, and national level. So um, I'm delighted to see expansion of early years, although I do have some concerns, concerns about um, do we have enough places at the moment? No, we don't. Um, we are working with children in, as an authority in Renfrewshire. We are working with children in Scotland um, to review child care provision within the authority. Um, it may be that we need to um, build some additional places or extend, but at the moment um, we have no idea where that money is coming from. Um, and 2017, to have that in place within three years, is it won't always be easy. As an early years professional, the recent um, advice that we utilise spare accommodation in museums and art galleries, um, I think is, is quite insulting to young children. I think there is an issue of quality there that we need to address. Um, certainly in my authority, where we have extended nurseries and in fact are building a new nursery at the moment, as part of an additional support needs school, the quality of the learning environment, and can I say the learning environment, is, is crucial. The other thing that I am concerned about is when we have blended um, provision, what does that actually mean? One of the things that, we've, that has been suggested is that we have childminders and nurseries sharing the care, as we used to call it. And it used to happen all the time, but we were very clear on what the early education, and can I say early education instead of early learning, because I believe that you can learn to put your hand in a fire, but it's much better, you know, learn not to put your hand in a fire, but it's actually better to be educated about it. Um, I think we need to be very clear on what the balance is and what a parent's right um, to that allocation will be. I think that needs sorted out for the 1140 hours. I also think we need to look very carefully at our young children or under five being in care provision for a longer day than our 18-year-olds are in school. I think that's very something that we need to look at. And I need to say I also agree with Naomi Eisenstadt the government's poverty uh, advisor, that young children will not make cognitive and social gains from two compressed days, particularly when they are living in poverty. All the research that shows that we need five days of consistent education and care to make those differences. Now, I fully real recognise that parents need care. Is this you now make yeah. your opening statement? Because no, no, it's not. I'm finishing off the question that I was asked. I realise parents need care, but if parents need care, we need to be careful about what we provide for them. And at the moment, we don't know what we can provide for them. Donald wanted to come in. Oh, yeah, sure. 
response to um, the, the question that you asked. Um, I, was, I was struck by the idea that we'd need 650 new centres, and I think um, officials right across the public sector are concerned that that's how we're going to start to measure the success of, of this policy, the number of shiny new centres that we build up in our communities. Really, we really need to look at that blended approach that we've discussed, where our colleagues in the private sector, where childminders are all going to play a key role here. And actually, there's a little, little bit of concern that we have that we may build a number of shiny new early year centres which are fantastic and then they're not populated by children and as our colleagues would say in early years what you want is a lively noisy busy happy environment for these very young and children and there's, there's a concern that if we just focus on building a certain number of buildings that's not really what we're trying to do and I think if, if, if what we've discussion we've had at COSLA is what we're looking here is about the quality of early learning mm -hmm. um, and yes there is a need to provide childcare we do need to help people get into work and that's about the wider economic responsibility we have as local authorities but we need to identify what the purpose of this policy is and if it's quality early learning we need to have a think about how we do that and the resources associated with it. Um, thank, you, thank you very much um, for, your, for your answers. Um, and as you've sort of intimated in some of the answers, there will be a need, obviously, for some capital investment, whether it is new facilities, whether it's expansion, or looking at new other processes. On Monday, um, uh, you'll no doubt be aware, the Scottish Local Government Partnership convener, Councillor Jenny Lane, um, in relation to the expansion of childcare, um, stated, and I'll quote again, that the SLGP have not had a single piece of information on what the capital investment will be, or when the government will even begin to put milestones in place so we can at least start planning. And because of the reluctance uh, to have communication uh, on these particular details, and again, I will quote, it will now be impossible to implement the policy in the time promised. So first of all, to ask the SLGP, what information um, is lacking? Um, what impact is this having on you being able to plan in relation to your capital plan and your budget? Uh, and in relation to the timelines promised, how far behind do you think we are? We have no information on uh, the amount of capital that will be available. So until we have that, we cannot plan in, in, in any detail. And when we plan with um, new facilities, we plan with parents. Um, parents are, are involved in the design um, right from the beginning. They're involved in the design of all our new education establishments. So that takes time and process, and then you have building time. So, and you also have to plan the building um, programme. So, you know, we, it, it is unlikely that we would have it all completed within four or five years, um, because there is also the availability of contractors to build. Is, is that the same experience with COSLA as well? I think COSLA is in a slightly different position in that both myself and, and my officers are involved uh, with Scottish Government. Um, we sit on, I think, all the all the um, strategic level boards to, to look at this. Uh, so we're in a slightly different position. I think um, we have perhaps a better understanding of what might be coming down the track, would that be fair to say? Mm -hmm. I, th I think, mm -hmm. to, to be clear, um, I'm aware there's a lot of work going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is, we're, we're reassured that this, is, this has been considered at the highest level, both at official level and political level. There's awareness of the timescales. Mm -hmm. I think we'd have to agree that there is a concern across all local authorities that um, if we were going to be asked to deliver the entirety of this programme by 2020, that that's becoming more and more difficult. Mm -hmm as delays continue, but I do think there is a recognition of that and I expect that we should see some, some progress in the new year. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've just got one last question, a slightly yeah. different thing. Just um, again from Fair Funding for Our Children um, in their submission point to a case study um, of, a, of a lady who they've called Jane, um, where in West Lothian, essentially, she couldn't get her son into a partnership placement with a, a private nursery. Um, in the end, uh, she was advised by the council within West Lothian um, that uh, she could use you know, a council one which was, which was um, nearer to her home. In the end, she actually got, about 10 minutes away, a placement in Edinburgh, um, because there's a relationship between Edinburgh City Council and the bordering councils, and West Lothian are reimbursing Edinburgh for that. So now she's found this obviously particularly bizarre 
that that's happened. So can you sort of explain why we can have this situation with local authorities that you know one resident in this case has had to go to a neighbouring council but her own local authority is paying for it and she can't get it in her own community? It's, it just seems a bit strange. I think this actually came up at the last committee, and the colleague that was with me at the time to say we, we actually do have arrangements in place for cross-boundary mm -hmm. placements, if you like. And I, I know that that was, that was one particular example. And I think in the response that we, we, we sent out the other day, I think there are examples of actually other areas where arrangements are yeah. more uh, fluid, I think. And I think in West Lothian in particular, there's, there's an example from West Lothian. Yeah, I suppose, uh, ju and ju just to, to be very open, I'm a resident of West Lothian, I'm also a working parent, um, and um, I accept the validity of, of that perspective. My own perspective was that my youngest child did have the very quality, high quality early learning plus wraparound, which was available to me to buy additional hours. That's what we want. That's definitely what we want in local authorities. I actually think it's a strength as well, so I suppose the, the point is there's there's, there's good stories as well across all local authority areas. Um, but what we, what we really want is you would expect us to make sure that there is cross-boundary arrangements so that if a resident of, for example, East Ayrshire mm -hmm. um, travels to North Ayrshire for their work and actually it's easier for that parent to put their child into a, an establishment in North Ayrshire, that we as local authority should be able to make that happen. And I think that there's a real strength that we are committed to that and we're building that up and hopefully that will help to alleviate some of the concerns experienced by that lady and others okay. who are experiencing that. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Daniel, <coughs> I'd just like to begin actually just by following on from some of uh, Ross Thompson's questions. Um, I mean, particularly around the, the, sort of the lead-in time for, for new facilities, and I, and I totally accept that it's not all about brand-new, shiny buildings, but uh, Jacqueline Henry outlined, I think, a, a bit of a timeline. Certainly, my informal discussions, four years is a sort of a, an aggressive timeline for getting new facilities, three possibly for childcare. I mean, are those sorts of timelines that you'd say are, are kind of reasonable rules of thumb in terms of the, 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 what you need to, to build new facilities? Could I start by saying that you know, I, I'm fortunate that I have frequent discussions with, with the Minister. And I, I was in a meeting a few, few weeks ago, and he made it quite clear then that he doesn't expect 1,140 hours to just... There'll be a, a, a point in the calendar where we go from 600 to 1,140. So I think you, we will have certain tranches of, of, of this uh, development coming out. I think, uh, from a causal point of view, it would be very difficult to actually answer that on a causal basis, because you think about it, you know, click manager will need a lot less than what Edinburgh City needs and things like that. So I suppose the timelines would be up for each individual council. I know that each individual council that I represent are committed to this. You know, each individual council realises the health benefits, the educational benefits, the GERFEC, which is what you know, ultimately we're here to talk about. So I know that each individual authority will do their absolute best. We're planning for it already. You know, we've got um, builds coming out the ground that will actually encompass 1140 hours. So there's staff planning that already. And I suppose what we would ask again is that we just up, up the pace a bit. A, you know, a minority of locally authority places are actually able to offer lunch at the mm -hmm. moment, according to the figures I've seen. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, that sort mm -hmm. of gives you a sense of the scale mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. investment that's required. I mean. Do you need the, those capital plans in place within the next six months, 12 months, 18 months? You know, roughly when do you need that in place so that you can be sure of having the, the, the provision of the 1140 hours mm -hmm. by the end of this parliamentary term? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's just good, good to add to that. I, I think it, it is difficult to answer definitively mm -hmm. your question. However, I think the answer is as soon as we possibly can. If, if, if you think about not just the capital investment, and clearly a number of us here are involved in major uh, school estate management programmes, and clearly the lead-in time planning to build to actual operational buildings is quite considerable. When you look at the expansion proposed here, a doubling of the hours, a workforce which is somewhere in the region of 20,000 more early years and childcare workers in Scotland. Now, the capital aspect of your question clearly is absolutely critical in terms of three or four years as a time frame of lead-in, but the workforce elements to deliver the doubling of the hours is absolutely critical too. Uh, so I suppose the two things go hand in hand, and I suppose the, the position of the Scottish Local Government Partnership, as Councillor Henry has confirmed, and Jenny Lang has confirmed, is that 
if we continue with a position of uncertainty about capital and the other elements around workforce and revenue, then we are going to be absolutely up against it, despite our absolute ambition and commitment to delivering the aims of the policy. So the sooner that we get confirmation about the available uh, funding, the better. Otherwise, we will struggle, as Councillor Lang has said, to deliver the policy in the time frame indicated. You've neatly anticipated my next question, so thank you very much, which is about workforce. And, and indeed, you know, doubling up the hours means that we need more people as, as well as more facilities. I mean, wh what sort of capacity do we need to, in, in terms of training those people? Are you confident that we've got that in, in our, our colleges? And, and indeed, also, just any reflections you have in terms of that balance between, uh, you know, tr trained childcare professionals and teachers within um, the, 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 the learning context? Perhaps I, I could take that one because... Um, Immediately previous to becoming a convener, I was responsible for both undergraduate and postgraduate early years courses at one of our, our universities. Um, 20,000 nursery workers, officers, just basic grade, would take two years at college. Um, so we'd need to be sure that our colleges have that capacity. Um, nursery to manage. It will also require management level as well. That's something that we haven't looked at. There is just the basic nursery provision, nursery, 20,000 nursery workers. Now that's two years of college or they can be on the job trained, but that requires a, a mass of already trained workers to assist them and to assess them. It also means as nurseries get bigger, you have the management of those nurseries and that means that we need degree educated um, staff to do that, to lead on the nurseries. Uh, if it's a daycare nursery, uh, it, that's, that can be done at an ordinary degree level. If they're in a school, that brings much greater um, sort of pro management provision, we then need to look at job sizing. The job sizing tool isn't accurate for nursery provision. You're also looking at um, an area where head teachers um, and teachers are not there for 12 weeks, that perhaps if you have flexible provision in the nursery, they're there, so you need to put in extra staffing. The, the hours are different, as you've already alluded to, we've got catering and clean, additional catering and cleaning costs. So the 20,000 workers, yes, there is an issue there, but there's also a management issue that needs to be looked at. In terms of the, the difference between a BA professional and, and a teacher. Um, a BA professional, will, a childhood practitioner, um, will typically have either come through the college or SVQ route, taken an, an additional SVQ and um, carry out a year at university or um, be a part-time year, would be two years. Um, or I, I believe there is some further a vocational qualification assessment. A teacher would have the general four-year BA honours course, um, which would be looking much more in-depth at education processes. Yeah, thank you very much. Just a couple of points I would like to make. Uh, I, I think our local authorities are already thinking about this. Um, I, I think the modern apprenticeships are going to be critical here. Uh, I know, I mean, I know I'm not, not here to talk about my own authority, but my own authority, we've already gone out to get more and modern apprentices. So I think, I think local authorities have a critical role here to actually nurture our own as well. I've already raised this as well, both with uh, Mr Hepburn and Mr MacDonald. Uh, if you go back to the developing the young workforce, which I think is, is a very, very good piece of work, you know, we already have a, a framework of how to, how to do this. You know, if you think about all the work that's been done in STEM, if you think about the amount of work that's going into the vocational and the academic stuff, I think we actually have a, a scheme here that, that we could use. I think, and I've said this before in front of the committee, I think as well we have to have, again, a blinded approach. I, I think we may struggle to get 20,000 young people 
interested in this. So we have to look at our, our workforce at large. You know, we do have parents that have perhaps brought up their own children. Uh, the hours might suit them. You know, we should be encouraging older people back into this area. They have the expertise and things like that. So I, I would agree that you, it's a thing we really need to get on with. But I, th I think we've got some good work started already. I mean, I think we could go on for some time on this, but if you do have any information about the capacity required, both in terms of people and timelines for capital, I think it would be very interesting to see any assessment you have on that. Mm -hmm. So I've got one final question, which is, there's at the beginning of this session, and there's one in particular about take-up. So we've had figures just released by the Care Inspectorate showing that uh, the take-up for funded childcare is around 70%, but the government's figures really essentially claim 99%. Within that detail, it's a rather remarkable fact that our Garland Butte has 115% take-up. So my question is, which do you think of those two figures is, is closest to reality and, and what? From our point of view, I think it depends which age group you're looking at. For, what, for one four thing, year olds. you know, with four-year-olds, yes, I, I would think it's, it's more likely to to be nearer the 97, 98 level. We do, in fact, have 108%, but part of that is um, double counting because of children attending more than one facility. So if you need, wanting to look at the number of children benefiting rather than the number of places taken yes. up, the care inspectorate figure is more likely to be right, is it not? I cannot say for definite. Yeah, I, I, we've not had time to, to reflect on this, but you know, one thing I would want to say is that it's not a, a requirement of a parent to put their child into early years, and we have to take that into account. A lot of it's parental choice. You know, we're not a nanny state. I, you know, I can no more force a parent to put their child into early years than I can force them to put them into to the vulnerable two-year-olds. So I think we have to take a degree of parental choice into this as well. And I, I, think, I think there is work to do, again, on you know, whether we're 75 or 115. I'd go for something in the middle. Can I just suggest that every council should be looking for 115 per cent? That would be a very impressive thing. Uh, Ross? Thanks very much, Convener. It's very much following on on some of the themes that have already been touched on. It's about um, access to nursery teachers. In discussions that I've had with trade unions recently, they've had a lot of concern about what the definition of access to a teacher actually means. Now, I think there was uh, some media coverage this week showing that just over one in four uh, pre-school pupils don't have access to a nursery teacher, but some of the concerns that I've had is that access has been defined as broadly as a nursery teacher not having any direct contact with the children, but advising or directing childcare workers. Is this uh, an issue of that be not being well defined, or is this simply a reality of budget constraints over recent years? If I Perhaps I could, I could start that. I think it's both, to be honest. I think there is a lack of definition of what a nursery teacher actually does. And as a former nursery teacher and a trainer, a educator of, of nursery teachers, I find that a, a, a source of some um, regret. Um, within... Uh, this has been a move for a number, a number of years. Um, in Renfrewshire, we have taken the position that nursery teachers are a valuable part of the nursery team. Uh, they provide particular skills, particularly around um, the transition period of, of children into to primary, and we've actually um, improved the number of teachers um, in our nursery team, it was it was one of the first things that that we did when I became convener. Um, we improved the, the number by fifty percent. We still don't have enough. Um, we, all of our centres have access to a teacher on a regular basis, and that would depend on the needs within the centre because some of our centres may have children that have, there is a higher concentration of deprivation or particular problems. Um, so some of them would have 
a teacher working directly with the children and with the staff. Others, the teacher would be more of a, a um, consultant, um, a, a, someone to guide the childcare staff. It really depends on the, the facility. Just, just a point I, I would like to make about that, and I have just confirmed with, with my colleague, nursery teachers are not within the protected teacher numbers. So mm -hmm. I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I dare say we'll come on to budgets at some point. But if that particular area is not within the protected amount within the budget, then because we have to protect you know, the stuff at PPI, we have to protect our teacher numbers, that there will be an element of budget constraints in there as well. I think one thing I would want, a more positive thing I'd want to say though, is that by 2018, the more deprived areas within Scotland will, will have a teacher. And I think that will make a difference. And I know a lot of them you know, already do, but I think in more deprived areas, I think that'll start to make a big difference as well. But I, th I think it's, it's both elements. Sorry, just. I don't want to correct my colleague here, but it's uh, by 2018 it will be a teacher or a BA childhood professional. It, it's not necessary, and that's an issue if it's one or the other, unless you you know what that remit is and what the difference is. How do you you allocate them appropriately? Thanks. And yeah, I think that it does make a significant difference, particularly in terms of uh, transition to primary school, even things like identification of additional support needs, etc. But we will be getting on to that later. Just one final question on, on that. What is your expectation of how this ratio will fare, that the fact that there's roughly one in four children currently without access, as we move towards the increase in child carers? I think that has to change against the backdrop of the workforce. I suppose it, we have to take that back to basics. You know, when we actually increase our workforce to to step up to 1140, what are we looking for? Yeah, are we looking for you know, nursery care workers, or are we looking for? And, and Jacqueline will correct me if it's you know qualified nursery teachers. And, and I apologise, I'm a secondary teacher. Uh, I'm not. I'm not as, as as up to speed on on the, the qualifications within early years. So I think it will depend on how that how that shapes in the future. I think we have an opportunity to look very carefully at nursery education and what we mean by nursery education and care. Um, you know, I think it's time that we had some evidence on what the difference um, at having a teacher can make, on what difference at having a teacher can make. There is evidence from other countries. Um, there is evidence from Cathy Silva, who used to be an advisor to the Scottish Government some time ago, um, that having a teacher makes a qualitative difference to um, young children. Uh, I think that's, from my reading of recent research, that's still the case. I think it's something that we need to look at, and that is not denigrating the work of BA childhood professionals, or indeed um, childhood practitioners who do a marvellous job, but we need to recognise that there are differences in skills and differences in their knowledge and experience, that we need to utilise all of that to help uh, promote the education and care of young children. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Ross. Gillian? Um, yeah, I have a question, first of all, for Councillor Henry. Um, you clearly have a lot of views on how this should be delivered and, and the issues around providing the 1,140 uh, 1, hours. Can I ask what the uh, SLGP engagement has been with the Minister for Child Care in early years? Um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a great deal of, of um, engagement with the Minister. Uh, well, for a, a number of, of months, years, um, we weren't really recognised because we were, you know, we had previously, as authorities, been part of COSLA and we'd moved away from that. A meeting with the Minister for Early Years and Child Care? I am not sure if... Uh, I, I, I would need to go back and, and check um, with... Uh, the leadership of yeah, it strikes SGLP. me that if you have very strong views about the delivery of the the, the, the hours mm. the engagement with the minister would probably be the first thing that I would do so um, yeah would you like I to mean go on personally to say that you'd I'd, like to have a meeting with the minister oh, for yes and with previous ministers I have engaged on a number mm -hmm. of issues 
I but not in this yes. case. Not at this crucial point where you are planning. No, I, I, was, plan. I was part and did um, question the cabinet secretary at a recent meeting that um, was hosted by COSLAN, which mm -hmm. uh, we participated in. But in order to have a, a frank and open discussion about your concerns about the delivery of this programme, which the government mm -hmm. is ha pledging to do as part of their manifesto, would you not say that having a, a meeting with the Minister for childcare in early years would be a number one priority for the group like yourselves, in the same way that Councillor Primrose has said she has. Sorry, just, just to say that um, in, in, in answer to your question, I suppose as we indicated earlier, um, what we are anticipating is an announcement from government about the level of resource, the time frame, the programme towards the 11.40. And in a sense, um, the issues that we've raised as a local government partnership and as COSLA, which have been uh, relayed, relayed to the committee just now, are anticipating something soon um, about what that programme would look like, what the level of resource commitment would be like. And in that regard, then the engagement has more uh, meaning in the sense of what it is that we believe we can deliver against the backdrop of resource. That's not to deny your question, and I, and, and I would ask that we go back and just check what interaction has been by other parts of the leadership mm -hmm. of SLGP, but certainly the indications of concern which have been indicated by our colleagues in COSLA, I think are well known uh, to government ministers and the cabinet secretary. Take your point, absolutely. And there is an indication that we are to hear and indications of resource commitment are to be made soon. Uh, in that sense, that, I think, would be a, a very opposite point in which to engage in further discussions about the reality of delivery against the time frame. Glad to hear you say that because I'm sitting here and I'm hearing uh, engagement happening directly with government ministers from COSLA, but I'm, I'm hearing... a. Uh, we can't do this, we can't do this, we can't do this from, no, from yourself. And, and I have to be frank with you, that is the impression I'm getting. Um, can I actually come on to my, my, my question that I was going to, uh, I'd actually planned to ask. Would you say that the, from, from both groups that the current childcare offer that local authorities that you represent, would you say that it meets the needs of parents in terms of flexibility at the moment? And what engagement have you had with parents in order to ascertain whether they feel that it's flexible in any kind of formal way? I'll take that uh, to start with. Um, I think I've already used this statistic. 97% of carers and parents are satisfied or very satisfied with the service provided. We, we understand that we need to build in more flexibility, but our, our agreement, our commitment at the time was to get the 600 hours up and running. So councils are now looking at the flexibility. In my own authority, we have three trials, I think, going on at the moment. Uh, I think one's from eight to eight and things like that. So we're actively working on that now. The parent voice, I think, is a very important one. Uh, Jane, do you want to come in on that? Yes, yeah, so uh, just to support what Councillor Primrose was saying, COSLA officials have been having discussions with national parent groups who are more representative like, than, than individuals who are equally um, able to, to raise their concerns locally. And I think there is a concern that um, working parents require as much flexibility as they possibly can to continue to work. And obviously we have a responsibility to our children and young people, and we also have an economic responsibility to ensure that people have access to work. So we're not ducking that at all. I think uh, we are starting on a strong basis, has been discussed around the 600 hours, and that will build. And there's definitely a place for our colleagues in Childminders and in other prov providers to support us in doing that. I think the point I would make, though, in relation to the 1140, if I'm able to, is that some of the discussions around how that provision will be funded will be very important as to how local authorities are able to provide their very high quality provision. And um, if there's a suggestion that um, there's a sort of childcare account option, that would prohibit local authorities from meaningfully delivering, planning and delivering a service for all parents, whether they're working or not. And, and, and it's really about making the equity ac across the piece. Um, we need to know the number of children that are coming in so we can identify how many establishments we need. We need to know how many trained colleagues of whatever calibre that we need to be in there. Um, and so that, that's just our plea around the, the blueprint that's currently out for consultation at the moment, which is great groundwork has started. Um, and in relation to the 1140, we're going to need some real clarity around funding to make sure we deliver what we're required as local authorities. But at the same time, you, uh, that, that, that funding could be informed by work that you could be doing now 
to actually ascertain the type of provision that people actually are going to want to access in yeah. terms of flexibility, in terms of you know, location mm. and, and whatever. Yeah. So my, my, uh, my question to, to, to both groups, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Councillor Hendry as well, what are you doing now to ascertain what parents want? Right. First of all, can I apologise if you think that, that we are saying we can do this? Because in actual fact, I think both uh, Mr McLeod and myself, as we've gone through, have said this is what we're doing in advance of government policy. So, you know, we and my colleagues in the Scottish Local Government Partnership are very much at the forefront of developing policy. And we do have engagement with ministers. We are a much smaller organisation than COSLA. Most of our engagement with ministers will come through our leaders committee uh, to which education conveners will um, feed into that and also directly with ministers. But in terms of what we are doing with parents, well, we've just um, actually completed a survey of parents in which 50% said that they would prefer the traditional, just under, th no, 50% said um, they would prefer the traditional three to five part day. 50% said they wanted um, more uh, flexibility. In addition to that, as I think I've mentioned, we've commissioned children in Scotland to do a more involved piece of, of work, not only looking at early years childcare, but also at out of school um, care, and we've also commissioned Glasgow University, I think, in fact, they've just completed um, a piece of research where they have spoken to parents on our behalf as well. So, yes, we are doing a lot. We also do um, biannual surveys of, of parents, and I personally meet with uh, parent council forum chairs um, on a six weekly basis and issues such as this are discussed there so there's quite a lot going on it would be very this. helpful actually i would uh, convene if, if we maybe got some of the reports from these surveys back so that we could see some of this the, this research i'm sure that'd be doable yeah. Eh? Yeah. thank you councillor henry councillor primrose just just a very very quick point which will answer that uh, councils have a statutory duty to go out to parents every two years and that is fed back so we, we already do that so it's a statutory duty so we have to yeah. okay, thank you thank you Joey. thank you Joanne. Yeah, thank you very much um i'm interested in this issue about uptake from two separate groups i mean you say that we're not the nanny state and you can't make people um, send their children to nursery. I, I don't think I've come across a lot of families where they're saying we're not interested in the, the free childcare that's available. From the figures from Fair Funding for Our Kids, they say that 89% of all council nursery placed for three to five year olds were half days only. Do you think that might have some impact on uptake? I, I, I think that is, is probably part of the case as well. And you, I think when I've said this when we're talking about going out to flexibility. You know, I think this will be in the next phase of our 600 and then going into 1140. I, th I think we do need to have flexibility. And I, I take your point about not being a, a nanny state. But in, in my own ward, um, you know, we have a high... Some parts have a high SIMD rating. And I have actually met parents who have said, well, it's not worth me taking my child in. And I think we still need to tackle that. I still think we've got some work to do there. That we're not we're not a nanny state, but I think we need to we need to do more to encourage parents to bring that in. And I think that's why we have to start this engagement very early on. Yeah, you know, I think this is where we have to bring our health visitors, our, our GP practice and things like that. That when you're talking about GIRFEC, you're not just talking about the education department. So I, we, we all know, you know the stuff that you know, Harry Burns has, has made very public, that if we can actually access these youngsters much earlier on, then we ha would have a higher chance of getting people to come in. Two slightly different points. Working parents, mm -hmm. half days, I mean, I abandoned. It was too complicated for mm -hmm. me, and that's 20 years ago. And I was fortunate I was able to make a different kind of provision. So we do need to think about working parents actually being reasonable about... I mean, I, I hear what Councillor Henry says about youngsters being in care. Don't make me feel any more guilty than I was at the time. 24 hours a day or whatever it was. But I think families then make balances in other ways. But realistically, if you're, if you're trying to manage your working life, your care package has to reflect that. And the idea that 
two and a half hours, three hours in the morning or an afternoon doesn't do anything other than add to the complications, I think, is, is one problem. But I think there's a, so I'm interested in how you think, what are the options, how do you deal with that? And secondly, the group of, of people who perhaps aren't in work, and I don't know if you have figures around, for example, youngsters who are registered to attend a nursery but are less likely to attend for their full hours, and how do we address that question, which is really the two things that childcare wants to do, which is support parents to work, but also support young people to learn who may be in more difficult circumstances. So how do you think you address that second question? Just to make a, a brief comment, I agree absolutely you know, with, with working parents. And I think in a perfect world, and we're not in a perfect world, we would have childcare rolled out. You know, childcare does not stop when your child reaches five. Uh, I mean, I, we all know that, you know, my boy's 18 and a half. Um, you know, I, I think an ideal world would, would have provision for for people up to maybe even primary seven. Uh, but I mean, I, I'm more than aware of the fact that you know, we, we are in financially difficult times. But that is a point that you know, we very much take on board. And uh, just to go back to it, we are looking at flexibility. Um, I have a, and I think I've mentioned it, that's going in from eight to eight, wrap around that, you know, that sort of thing. So we do need to take that into account. We've got um, various buildings that will be open 52 weeks a year. Unfortunately, I don't work the summer. Ho I don't work teacher um, holidays anymore. Um, so we do need to have a 52-week provision, and we do need to have it seven days a week. So you know, this is where the flexibility, the trials that we have, will be will be important. And as the second question about the, the actual numbers, I don't think we have that to hand. No, no, because no, I don't have those numbers. Mm -hmm. Sorry. To look at where mm -hmm. youngsters have access to provision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The families perhaps aren't working. How mm -hmm. does the nursery pull them in if there's mm -hmm. not a support to get them into nursery? Mm -hmm. It's a well, challenge in, in schools, so I wonder yeah, whether it's yeah. also I mean, a challenge in schools. What we've been looking at is um, a community provision, provision within the community. We're actually quite lucky in Renfrewshire, if I speak from my own authority here, in as much as our partnership and local authority provision is almost at the same level. One's 34, the other one's 33. Um, and even within the local authority provision, we have uh, 12 extended day nurseries um, that are open from seven till six or from, from eight till six, 52 weeks a year. So there is a range of provision um, and we've tried to look at that in communities so that within each community, because within Renfrewshire, as I've just said, about half of the parents who responded to our consultation wanted part day provision, um, still wanted part day provision um, for three to five year olds. So we need to have a range of provision within a community. It may be that not every nursery will provide the full range, but within the community there will be a range. And that's something we're looking at just now. We're also looking at further work with childminders. Two, two very last, very brief points. Can you clarify for me? I understand that social care workers are expected to get the Scottish living wage. Will care workers in the nursery setting be get the same? And is there an implication for your budgets on that? And secondly, in the context of very significant cuts to local government, what capacity is in the system to deliver childcare? Because you're going to deliver this. It's not just within the education department, it'll be your planning department, it'll be all the other bits round about um, local government which allow you to deliver that. What is the context of the budget cuts that are going to impact on your ability to deliver this programme? From the point of view, all our staff are on the living wage. I think that, that's, that's a big benefit. Um, I think we do have to, to look at budgets. However, the 600 years, the 600 years, the 600 hours <laughs> fully feels like that. It's fully funded. Yes, so uh, we would hope that the 1140 would be the same. But I think it's an important point to make, and it's a very valuable point to raise, which is um, the degree to which we have um, funding for certain things, like the delivery of early learning. It doesn't take into account the very integrated way we work in local authorities, so there'll be a number of services that support the children and the families, and actually may be key to making sure we get a better take-up. And as those services are cut, just because of the degree of local authority cuts we've, we've 
received over the last few years, there is, there is less capacity in the system to make sure we're delivering at the level we want to deliver it. And it's not just the child. I'm not just. I mean, I, I yeah. all of the bits of a system that are softer around the core services, like in a school where it's a classroom system or whatever. These are the, all things that have gone. But if your planning department stripped away, what's your capacity then to actually deliver on a building program around nurseries? What I diluted too earlier when I was, I was speaking about um, the capital programme. It's my understanding, yes, um, certainly within the Scottish Local Government Partnership and, and within my own authority, yeah, absolutely, um, we, would, we would pay the living wage, uh, the Scottish living wage and above above the Scottish living wage um, to our staff. However, um, it's my understanding that that is, um, unlike social care, nursery care workers um, in the independent sector, although many do pay, it is not a requirement. Um, I do think budget cuts have had and, continue, and will continue to have a, a massive impact on local authorities and our ability to um, deliver everything that, that we would hope to deliver. Thank you. Okay. Richard, uh, teacher numbers. <coughs> Thank you. I just want to ask a quick couple of questions on teacher numbers. And clearly we saw the statistics this week, which in some ways were welcome because of the extra numbers uh, across Scotland. But there were, of course, some councils where the numbers have declined, showing particular pressures in some parts of the country. And I should declare that I represent Murray, which happens to have had the biggest decline, I think, in terms of this week's statistics, at least one of the biggest over recent times. Uh, I just want to ask what fresh thinking is taking place within local government to attract teachers into the profession? Can I just say that, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, the, the teacher statistics, they came out yesterday, but were actually very, very positive, and we welcome that. And I certainly realise that you both yourself in the Highlands and in Shetland as well, that you some of the authorities that you would have been sanctioned last year haven't had that. So I, I think that's, that's a very positive step. I think the underlying issue here is about workforce. Um, and I think a lot of good work has been taking place. If you look at one piece of work in particular, Northern Alliance, very proactive and Northern Alliance is a region, a regional organisation that has been grassroots. So they've looked at real issues. I mean, I, I was reading in the BBC last night that uh, there was a school, I think it was in Fort William, they've got higher computing studies and no computing teacher. So I mean, th you, that is the sort of thing that we're looking at. I think there's a lot of very, very good practice around, but as I say, particularly you know, in Northern Alliance to try, to try and do that. Within Northern Alliance as well, they've agreed to stop competing against each other. Uh, that, you know, they've seen it as a whole, so I think there's a lot of golden hellos and things like that, and I think they're, they're maybe not quite as popular, that they're seeing it as an issue um, all around. I think we need to work better within our schools. I think, for example, if one school can't offer advanced higher chemistry, we have to let another school do that. So I think increasingly our schools will be, will be moving into specialist areas, and I think, too, that we're going to have to expect some children to, to maybe go to a different school to have that delivered. Not every school can deliver every single advanced hire, and I think we have to accept that. I think we've got a lot of work to do to encourage people into, into the sector. And you, you, when I was teaching, we were, we were going into the, the new curriculum and things like that. Very new and very shiny, very exciting. But I think at the moment, you know, when, when we look in newspapers, when we look at the media, you know, education's up there all the time, and it's, you know, it's bad news stories. It's you know, about budget cuts, it's about bad behaviour in schools, it's about, you know, buildings not being up to standard. And I think as a profession, and I mean that, you know, with unions, with COSLA, you know, with parliamentarians, that we need to get education back on a, on a firm footing. You know, if you look at lawyers, oh, they're great, you know, they, they help the underdog, doctors saves lives, you know, nurses are wonderful, teachers, well, you know, they just take a lot of sticks. So I, I think we need to almost reinvent teaching as a profession. We need to encourage younger people in. We need to encourage people, again, who've maybe, I think Aberdeen are doing it, I'm sure they are actually, people who've already had a career, you know, bringing them back in. So you know, a lot of people, as you're probably more aware than I, have come from the, the oil uh, industry. They've been retrained and they're going back out. So we need to be proactive, we really do. And you, we need to get teaching back up there with a profession that people want to do. It's a great job. You know, it's a really good job and, and you do, sorry, I, I'm getting, but, you know, you, we do need to get that out. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I agree that the image 
broadcast and promoted by the local authorities for teachers and education is very important because often our local headlines are dominated by the cuts and therefore young teachers looking for somewhere to work and looking at the map of Scotland perhaps have the wrong impression of certain parts of the country of where they may wish to work. So I'd like to, in the future, hear more about that kind of work. I think someone else wants to come in. Just... Councillor Hendry had said, I think there's a, there's a number of things actively being done by local government. So um, our colleagues in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire are, are working with ex-oil and gas employees specifically. We're working with council workers who um, there may be less need for their jobs in relation to the, the wider local government sector, but actually they've got a lot of skills and, and we're looking at bringing them into retraining. Um, we need to really see this in the light of the wider issues around our rural and remote areas. Um, we're, we're seeing depopulation and actually we're, we're needing to encourage people into these areas with the real benefits that rural and remote live, uh, environments and communities can bring. And I think that's often lost. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to work with the initial teacher training providers, the universities make sure that we're encouraging people from these communities into teaching and that when teachers are doing their probation year they get the opportunity to work in rural areas to really benefit from that rural environment um, and it always strikes me when I'm, I'm, I'm doing my work with COSLA and I'm speaking to teachers and head teachers in rural communities how close they are to their communities and the real benefits that brings not only to the communities but to them and their professionals so it's that same idea we are doing some stuff we need to work with wider partners to encourage people into our rural areas. I would just agree with, with what's been said there. There's a lot um, that local authorities are doing to promote teaching as a positive um, profession. And uh, we call it Grow Our Own. We, we're actually talking to young people in a much more positive way on a day and daily basis about the job of, of teaching. Um, we also are part of um, a, a <coughs> relationship with one of the universities, one of the teacher education institutions, um, where we are becoming more involved in that and hoping to, at an early stage with teaching students, to, to have them see us as a positive place to go. But it's also, um, Councillor Primrose mentioned the Northern Alliance, which uh, Aberdeen City is, is part of part of a Scottish local government partnership. Um, but the voluntary partnerships that every local authority um, has, and certainly the ones that we're involved with, that's uh, an area where we are beginning to, to work together on how we promote um, teaching and how we have more people coming forward. Um, to be teachers and just to agree with everything else that has been said is exactly what's happening. Can I just ask one other question? A more general question in terms of the allocation of resources, and I, I fully appreciate the very difficult decisions that local government have to take. And on the one hand, today we're discussing the need for resources to go towards education. One concern I always have is that teachers are expected to answer all of society's problems and close the attainment gap and it's going to happen in the classroom. And it's not going to happen just in the classroom. It's going to happen in the wider society. So can you explain to me how local government joins up all these policy objectives? What actually actually happens to ensure that when you're talking about a closing attainment gap, it's not just about what happens in the classroom. The local authorities are looking at the local housing situation, other deprivation factors, and so on. How's all that joined up? To, to begin with, if that's OK, and I think I would put this as, as one of the heart of the matter issues, if, if, if you wouldn't mind me saying that in relation to this debate, is that wraparound system. The, 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 the policy that drives the, this, in my very clear view, is get it right for every child. I said already that we are very fortunate in Renfrewshire to have very deliberately put together an integrated children's services system. And I think the answer to your question is children's services planning is a commitment uh, which is there in each local authority, which is discharged mm -hmm. through its children's services um, planning partnership through the community planning arrangements that Councillor Henry has referred to earlier on. And I think that one of the dangers that we must avoid is fragmentation of policy intent. And if fragmentation of policy intent takes us back to um, a world uh, where 
several decades ago, we integrated services to ensure they replicated the conditions of the families that many of us live in with children in our communities and, uh, and our societies. So that I think that the answer, teachers are not going to fix poverty. Um, and what happens in classrooms is incredibly important. But if it happens in the absence of what happens with social care, which is a key responsibility that I have, what happens around the Christie principles of prevention, your own point about housing, uh, and indeed all the parts, our um, family's first programme for, for early years, for example, has generated £3 million worth of unclaimed benefits. Now, that money in the pocket of impoverished families has made a huge difference mm -hmm. to the outcomes of these children, as much as what would happen potentially in the classroom. But the two things need to join up. So I suppose my point is, is that within the context of our budget, I have a £200 million budget led uh, by myself and, uh, and Councillor Henry, and what we do is we deliberately look at all of the spend in terms of the needs of our population. In Renshaw, we happen to have a very developed uh, needs analysis of our population. We've just completed a survey of 11,000 young people, uh, one, one kind of unique point of what we do. But I suppose the point is, is that local authorities have to join up our intent both in financial terms mm -hmm. and in children's services planning terms to, to, to ensure that GIRFEC is, is, is the delivery point, not just what happens in schools. And I think that's the issue that is actually a heart of the matter, part of the debate. Your point about the benefits is, is, a, is a powerful illustration. I'm just trying to understand in my head the wider point about how a local authority joins up all the policies across the council. So if there's a catchment area that's got a particular challenge with attainment, how does that link into inward investment strategies? How does that link into uh, benefits take up, as you've said? So not just children's services, but the wider council's responsibilities. How are they joined up? I think the answer would be in relation to community planning uh, mm. and also in relation to the council's uh, plan in Renshire. Again, not talking for all of the Scottish mm. Local Government Partnership, but for example, we have uh, we have had a tackle the poverty commission. So what that has examined in very great detail are the kind of issues that you have described. We have absolutely clear views about where the issues lie within our communities. Those join up with our housing investment uh, decisions. They join up with our job creation decisions, and they look at all of the parts that we require to have in place to ensure that we close the gap in all senses, yeah. not just in the education sure. sense. So I think. Having Having, having that Tackling Poverty Commission, but also having a strategic intent lined up with the investment and the money that we have available is the way that we do it. And in children's services, that's planning. But in, the, in relation to the whole of local authorities, that's what council plans do. But it is also about being aware of the needs in your area and making sure that all of the policies you've talked about are aligned towards need. And we believe that in Renfrewshire that we do that. And I think uh, Scottish Local Government Partnership would claim the same for its other uh, participating authorities. Okay. I am tempted to ask the big question about why the attainment gap is so yeah, big if all these policies are joined up, but it's not like to get viewers to, to yeah. answer that but, question. But so. Can I, I, I just ask people to make their responses as short, please, because we have still got quite a bit to go through. Daniel, I'm afraid I can't give you that supplementary. We really have got quite a lot to go through just now. My apologies. Uh, Fulton. Thanks, and thanks panellists, for uh, coming in. I'll start off with quite a, a simple question. For today's uh, committee, we were asked to speak to a school in our, our own constituency area. <clears throat> um, what's your view, do you think, that local authorities should engage with a parliament committee processes such as this? So probably yourself, yeah. the Council uh, of first. Yeah, I think it's absolutely critical. And you know, I said that in my opening speech. You know, we're not we're not that far apart. You know, we're all politicians to a greater or lesser extent. You know, as a society, we want the same thing. So I think it's absolutely critical. And I think we have to have a free and open discussion. I think, I mean, I've said this at a national conference that I was speaking at. I think sometimes we get too bogged down in things we don't agree about. You know, for example, I have tried very, very hard to get away from teacher numbers because we're just not going to agree in that. And, you know, there's no point in throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We just have to accept the fact that that's something that we're probably not going to agree on. And I think we have to park that and move on. So I, I think this is absolutely critical that we have this. I mean, I'm in a very fortunate position and that through my cause of job, I have regular meetings with parliamentarians, you know, through... East Asia as well. And I think it's very, very important that local authority has a voice because they say we want exactly the same thing. And I think this is an ideal opportunity. I'm glad that you've answered the, that so positively because 
what I'm now going to come to some of my uh, committee colleagues know is that actually I had real difficulty um, at getting teachers, well, should I say the local authority in North Lanarkshire, to agree for the teachers to speak with me specifically about um, this committee session today, of which the clerks had provided us a line of questioning, which was sent in advance to the local authorities so that it was clear and transparent for them. And it actually came as a real surprise to me, I have to say, because I've got a great working relationship with the schools in North Lanarkshire, and I, I just set up to go and meet them. Um, but as soon as the sort of political figures, if you like, the convener uh, of education became involved in the process, tremendous barriers were put up to the point that the, the meeting didn't happen. So can I ask, sorry, convener, um, can I ask, do you have any idea why North Lanarkshire Council would have acted in such a manner? I, I couldn't answer on behalf of North Lanarkshire Council, but certainly one of the things I've found about teachers, about my head teachers, I'm very fortunate, I know all my head teachers, and I have a very good relationship with them, and I've never encountered that. But as for the actual specific North Lanarkshire question, I'm not sure that we could really give you a, give you a, a definitive answer on that one. No, I, th I think just to be clear, I don't think Cosla could comment on that, and, but it would be fair to say that Cosla's position is that we would encourage um, parliamentarians to, to liaise with our communities in the same way we would expect elected members to. Um, so uh, apologies that, that, that that's happened. I'm sure it's a one-off incident, but it's certainly not something that's, that's a position across local government. Yeah, and I, and I would like to reiterate, I think that it is important to do that, that um, you know, the relationship I've got with it was high schools I was looking to speak to teaching staff in so that I could come to this committee prepared with what teachers in my constituency yeah. are actually highlighting as concerns. And I, I feel actually really disappointed that that didn't happen. But <clears throat> the schools in the area do a fantastic job. And as we've talked about already, and other, other members have said, it's, that they're working in difficult circumstances. So, you know, I, I, I do have a, a lot of faith in head teachers, And it kind of brings me on to my next uh, line of questioning. What, do you think that head teachers should have more say in the delivery of education given the, the plans? And do you think that this will help? to meet in the attainment gap challenges. And I'll maybe come to yourself, Councillor Henry, because we go. Um, speaking for my own authority, and, and I know for the Scottish Local Government Partnership authorities as well, our head teachers have, um, when it comes to learning and teaching within their school, they have the greatest say in that. In fact, they have the say within within their schools. Um, and I think that is right. As head teachers, former head teacher myself, you are the leader of learning. And I think that that is what head teachers want to do. Yep, could I, can I say something very quick about, about your first question? I was fortunate, I was in one of the North Lanarkshire schools recently as part of the DYW with, with Mr Herpin and Mr Swinney. We couldn't have been made any more welcome, to be honest with you. I think maybe you caught me on a bad day. Uh, I would agree with what uh, Councillor Henry has... To be fair, the point that Mr Fulton was making was not about the schools because his relationship with the schools has been excellent. The point he was button. making was about the education authority and the fact that they stopped him from going to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to the schools. So it's mm -hmm. two, it is two different okay, things, Councillor Okay, I'll, I'll take that, take them boards. We, you, there is, and I think, becoming increasingly clear, an agreement within what we would call the local government uh, family. Our response is not out at the moment. It will be out as soon as possible. Our response was agreed, yes, about, about the governance review. It goes back to what Councillor Henry was saying. You know, it, it's coming increasingly clear that head teachers are happy with what devolved management they have. The devolved, the devolved school management toolkit has devolved 95% of the budget. The head teachers, they don't want to be business administrators. They don't want to have to do things that we do. They don't want to have to you know, interview every single head teacher. They don't want that HR responsibility. They don't want you know, the responsibility for all the finance stuff. They actually want to lead learning communities. And another issue that I would have with putting that pressure on head teachers, if we talk about tackling bureaucracy, which I think we've all signed up to, I think you know, that's the thing that is going ahead. If we're serious about tackling bureaucracy at one level, you can't add another layer of bureaucracy. You can't tackle bureaucracy and add more bureaucracy. It, doesn't, it just doesn't add up. And I think increasingly our teachers are seeing that. I think that concerns me, and it goes back to some points we made earlier on as well, that if we're increasingly putting more and more pressures on head teachers who do a difficult job, and they do it, sorry, and they do it very well, um, 
if, if we have an issue whereby head teachers don't want to do that, then we're going into problems with recruitment. And if we can't recruit, we can't attain. So I think what we have at the moment is ideal. We have balances and checks, and I think that's where head teachers and certainly where local authorities would want to be. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can I come in a, a slightly different? Uh, yes, yes, um, yes. It's, it's still relating to the attainment gap. Um, obviously, the, you'll, you'll be aware of the, the piece of results uh, yes. last mm -hmm. week, uh, which uh, were uncomfortable reading, I think. So, you know, Terum, I think have quite a few people have used and would agree with that. And um, you'll know that John Swinney uh, brought the, the matter to the, uh, to the chamber and dealt with it head on. And I felt that was the right thing to do. How, how will councils respond? Has there been any? Because obviously there's, there's various uh, stakeholders involved in, in, in making sure that the education system is as best it can be. How, how are councils going to respond to the PISA results? Maybe take, take some of that and then pass over to Jane. Um, I think the PISA results have made difficult reading. I don't think anybody has welcomed them with, with open arms. So I think we have to accept that fact. But I think you know, the message I'd want to get out today is that as one piece of work. It was done 18 months ago. It actually only tests one specific thing. You're actually comparing apples with pears. So the Scottish education system is completely different to the Chinese education system. So you're comparing things that you probably can't compare. I think it's one piece of research. I think two of the Deputy First Minister's um, international uh, advisors have said more or less the same, that it doesn't make interest in reading, but you can't just see that as one complete picture of, of Scottish education. It's a snapshot. Councils aren't complacent, you have to say that, that we do identify the fact that we have work to do and you are not shying away from this. So yes, we've taken it on board. We have reservations perhaps about how it's been done, but I'll pass over to Jane. Come in first and then I'll come back to you. Sorry. Uh, Councillor Henry, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> yes, um, I would agree that PISA does not make pleasant reading for anyone in, in Scottish education. Um, never mind just in this room. Um, I do not think that a lot of it has been of a great surprise to us. We know that there is a problem with literacy um, and with numeracy and, and science for some time. I think local government are making um, attempts at improving things. For example, my own authority, we've invested money in a literacy development uh, programme with Strathclyde University that works not only with our, our primary colleagues, but also with subject literacy at, at secondary. And we are starting to see results in that, although it's, it's, it's fairly very early. And we are also beginning to look at numeracy and, and having discussions with university colleagues, because I think we need to look clearly at evidence. But I don't think we can look at these things in isolation. We talked about um, children's services, the team around the child. I think we also need to be looking at the context of what has happened in Scottish education. We've lost 4,000 teachers. You can't, you know, we can't take, um, make a cake with half the ingredients. Um, we we have improved that. Just now, in my own authority, we have used our own resources to increase the number of teachers, and I think that's been significant. Um, I know that we've had, you know, the, the, the teacher numbers that were mentioned earlier. Um, we've, we've had an increase in teacher numbers of 253 across Scotland. But to put that in context, um, when the Cabinet Secretary for Finance was leader of my council, we lost 250 within our own authority. So there have been issues there. There have been major cuts to um, council budgets, all of which affect teaching and learning. Classroom assistants have been you know, cut throughout Scotland. All of these resources have had an effect. What I think we need to do now is look at the best evidence and how we get it, we improve. Sorry, very briefly. Phil. Yes, it's actually very just a point, convener. I'd like to <clears throat> thank the panel for the response, and I know that it was a, a very difficult uh, question to answer in relation to the, the North Lanarkshire Council situation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I will make the letter that I'll be sending to the convener um, and the chief executive available to the, the convener here. Okay, thank you very much. We, we will discuss that.
Uh, listen, could, could, uh, I'm going to bring in Liz, and then you could respond to that as well, Liz, Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Councillor Primrose, could I ask you, um, on the back of the PISA results, uh, when the Cabinet Secretary had made a statement to Parliament, you, or the COSLA, made a comment in the paper that there is nothing in these results that suggests a change of governance will lead to improvement in these particular curricular areas. And you say in your letter to us uh, that you believe that the um, governance review is based on flawed assumptions and that it is not based on evidence. So I take it that when we have your contribution uh, from uh, COSLA to the governance review, you are going to be arguing in favour of the status quo. I don't think we're arguing in favour of the status quo. I think what we are, are arguing for is time to embed some of the things that have come through already. You know, if you look at the National Improvement Framework, that's just come in. You know, if you look at other examples, the 600 errors going to 1140, education won't change overnight. And I think both as local authority, but coming from schools, coming from head teachers, coming from other teachers, we need some time to let this all bed in. Evidence from your head teachers um, that you feel backs up that point. Will we get the evidence that you believe that head teachers are not in favour of more devolved responsibility? Mm. I, I think you will find that already in the IS submission, which is public. Uh, Sorry, will we get it in the COSLA one? Uh, um, is it in our COSLA one? So I, actually, we put this through, yes. Two, two weeks later, we'll just go back to Jane. Sure, just a point, of, a point of clarification for Councillor Primrose and for, and for the question, uh, Ms Smith. Uh, our submission doesn't include survey findings, if you like. What we have done since the governance review has been announced is we have brought the local government family together on a regular basis and we've asked them the question. So these are the representative organisations and trade unions which represent our teachers and our head teachers, primary, secondary, etc. Um, and we have asked them the question, which is... It's an important debate. I think that's the point we have to say. It's an important discussion to be having. Um, but we've asked them, what's holding you back? What's holding you back from delivering? And these representative organisations are not saying, well, actually, it's the local authority. It's all, it's all the support you're putting around us. So we've, we've questioned quite closely on that because it was important that we took that to our elected members before they, they understood that position and signed it off. And we've had a number of discussions, and that's been their position. The local authority is not holding them back. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, you've made quite a strong criticism of the government not having evidence based, so that's the reason I'm asking whether COSLA will be evidence based, because obviously, as a committee, we want to uh, work out what the best thing to do is, and that has to be based on evidence as far as we're concerned. I just make that point. Could I um, ask you also about uh, the, um, the powers issue? Are there powers that you feel that ought to be devolved further down to schools? I think at the moment, you come from you know, the evidence that we have, you know, we're in frequent discussions with, the, with our trade unions, I think that would be where we would go. I think, generally speaking, I think head teachers are comfortable with where they are. What they would like, perhaps, is more money, uh, and you, that will obviously be a decision made later on. But I think at the moment, you know, the default school management toolkit is there. They have control over what they want to have control over. I think, generally speaking, they have 95% of the budget. So they have control over learning and teaching. You've had the control over you know, things that go on in a classroom. And I think that's important. You know, councils maintain the sort of checks and balances. And I think that's important too. But from what I'm getting from, from trade union colleagues is that your head teachers are happy with this responsibility they have. And I think I said this earlier on, they're happy with that role. They don't want to go into business managers. They don't want to have any more uh, things that take them away from the actual role of a head teacher, which is to lead learning and teaching. Councillor Primrose, why is it that we have seen a successive decline in the standards in Scottish schools, which nobody wants to see? Why is it that people are content with the system that we have when we have declining standards? I think Councillor Henry has, asked that to certain extent, has answered that, I beg your pardon, that we do have budget issues and I think you, you cannot take that out of the debate. I, to come in on that, I think there have also been issues to do with pressures that teachers have felt under, and I know the, this committee have discussed it before, in relation to implementation of Curriculum for Excellence and the advice coming nationally, which at times has not been the clearest, um, I, th I think, um, is what certainly what I'm being told from our head teachers um, that they've had 
concerns with that, um, with the assessment process that um, SQA had, had um, put in place originally. So we've had a period where um, we've had budget cuts of services that support schools and that are in schools, like classroom assistants and uh, teachers, 4,000 teachers taken out. Um, we've also had a new curriculum where it hasn't always been the clearest information and advice coming through and where things have changed sometimes very quickly. Um, and we need to look at the advice, you know, the national organisations have changed over that period as well. If you think of Learning and Teaching Scotland, HMI, Education Scotland coming, to, you know, coming together as Education Scotland. So there has been a period of significant change and downward pressure in terms of, of resources. You know, they're getting dampened down. And I think that's an issue. And the OECD report, um, when it looks at Ontario, noted the, the need for increased uh, resources and how that allowed the schools there to flourish. My, my final point uh, is on exactly that, that I think you're right, that I think there has been confused guidance. And one of the most interesting statistics that came out yesterday was the comparison of local authorities in terms of getting to level four by S3. And there was a huge variation across the country. Now, I do not believe that that was to do with uh, you know, any, any difference in the pupils and, uh, and, and the staff who are in these local authorities, I firmly believe it's to do with the delivery of the Curriculum for Excellence, which is, you know, so different across different regions. Do you accept, as the two groups representing local authorities, that the delivery of the Curriculum for Excellence has been a fundamental problem in terms of raising standards? I think you have to look at the actual reason why Curriculum for Excellence is there. I think we have to be very careful in assessing the actual success of education and purely t in terms of exam passes. Uh, you know, we have really good high exam passing for the second highest this year and higher. That's very, very good. But what the Curriculum for Excellence is there to do is to actually broaden that so that you're not just focusing on academic skills. There's a great deal of vocational. And you're actually focusing on the whole person. I mean, you know the four the four capacities very, very well. And I think that's what we're looking at as well. I think we're still bedding in. You know, I, I think there's still some things to iron out. I think some of the things that have come out recently about uh, trying to cut some of the bureaucracy within the Curriculum for Excellence will help. But I certainly believe that the Curriculum for Excellence is, is a, a good piece of work. I had visitors over from France a couple of weeks ago, and they come over specifically to talk to me about Curriculum for Excellence. They're actually replicating that in their area in France. So I think Cosa would be of the opinion that the Curriculum for Excellence is the way forward. Okay. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not the way forward. What I'm saying is it's delivery is a serious issue. There are some very good councils who normally ha perform extremely well on the mm -hmm. national average. Yesterday, they were not performing well. And the reason was not because they were doing anything wrong in terms of the teaching. It's because of the timing and the structure of the courses. That is surely an issue for COSLA. I think that would be more of an issue for Education Scotland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could, could I perhaps come in here... Um, I think that, that we need to be careful that we don't take a simplistic analysis of the reason for a decline in standards. I think it's multifaceted and multi-layered. I think perhaps the delivery is, or parts of the delivery um, is part of the issue, but I do think there are other parts and it's been almost like a perfect storm um, where everything has, has come together at the same time. In terms of the delivery, I would perhaps use a teaching analogy. If you teach a class and four children don't get it, you might want to target them um, more. If 11 or 12, you might think, you know, is my delivery been, been what, it, what it should be as the content? delivered properly. If it's 25, you need to start looking at your, your own communication and the way that you have taught that lesson. And if you look over Scotland, we're all up and down here, and perhaps it's been the communication and uh, of that and the delivery of it. Okay, Liz. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Tavish. 
Thank you. Can I on the same theme ask um, Cosler if they were on the cu Curriculum Management Board? Yes. yes. So you'd be familiar with the 20,000 pages of guidance that teachers have been subjected to over the last nine years on the Curriculum for Excellence? I have been a teacher, I'm aware of that, yes. So what did Cosler do in the Curriculum Management Board to try and ease that back, given your very fair points that, in response to Richard about, mm -hmm. about the teaching profession? Mm -hmm. I personally don't sit in that, but uh, Jane does. Yes, yeah, so that, that's, that's an officer-based board, so I would represent COSLA on that. Um, we've, we've, we've acknowledged the concerns being raised up by teachers and head teachers in relation to this, and we have received a number of assurances that our colleagues in the other agencies are looking at this and taking it seriously. Um, so, to be fair, we have allowed, we've allowed that process to take place. Um, I think that what happened with, with the recent interventions by the Deputy First Minister, as you've seen a, a degree of pace in relation to that, um, and... There's been a full commitment, which I think is now being upheld, that this sheer amount of documentation that went to our teaching colleagues has been reduced. What our colleagues in the trade union say to us and on that, that management board is that then leads us a new set of guidance to get a hold of, and, and we need time to bet, allow that to bed in, which is sort of picking up some of the points that was raised by, by the two councillors up till now. So in relation to COSLA, yes, we were concerned that our teachers and head teachers had a large amount of bureaucracy. We accepted that to some extent we had, had a role to help them with that. And we also asked our colleagues in SQ and Education Scotland to assist with that. They were doing so, and then there was a degree of pace injected by the deputy. So they only did so after John Swinney got a grip of it this summer. You've had nine years of this. You'll know as a teacher how much this has been going on. So nothing yeah. was happening uh, over the last eight years until this summer, was it? Because at 20,000 p, I mean, how many more stats that have been presented to this committee on how much they've had, including the 1,820 experiences and outcomes and the latest 600 pages of benchmarks? I mean, how's any teacher meant to cope with all that? I take that on board, absolutely. I mean, I'm a teacher, and I think what, yeah. With I, Education I Scotland and SQA. Yeah, what well, did you do I, about it? Can I, can I make a couple of points? No, you, I'd like you to answer the question with great respect. Okay, yeah, I thank you, the actual, you, the 20,000 pages of documents. You know, the teachers you know, were not responsible for that. That is an education SQA responsibility. And, and I agree, it yeah, was cumbersome. And you know, I, I think we have agreed with the DFM that you, you have to streamline that back. So you know, I think the tackling the bureaucracy, there, there was support and councils did act on that. Um, did they, how, how did they react? How did they act yeah. on that? So I'm just trying to remember what date that was. Was that was the date of that report? was October 2013. 2013. So I think initial response to attack it started to take place. But yes, yeah, so I agree that we did have to up the pace, and I think the DFM was absolutely right. We agreed with him. You so know, you'd the, accept you have to take responsibility for the situation that teachers find themselves in today, which is, again, they've now been issued with 600 more pages. And the teacher showed me this on Monday in Shetland, mm -hmm. 600 pages mm -hmm. of benchmarks that have just mm -hmm. been issued. Mm -hmm. You know about all this, you've been mm -hmm. aware about it all, and you've accepted that as part mm -hmm. of your responsibilities in the, with your relationship with the government and with mm -hmm. SQA. And the One caveat, we don't issue them. That's SQA Education Scotland. I, we well don't aware have, of that. I don't have, we don't have control but you've just over... But you've just passed it all on. You've just fed it all on to teachers. With the support from the centre. But you, we, don't have, we don't have control over what the content of the exams will be or I'm what the content of the assessment will be. Well aware of that. Well aware of that. But I, I think it's, 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 a, it's a useful point to, to raise. And I think what, what is fair to say for local authorities is there's a data which we wanted to get it right to. Mm -hmm. And if you're being advised by the professionals in Education Scotland and SQ that this is what's required, then our councillors have a responsibility to their communities and their children to make sure they're not up with, withholding mm -hmm. that advice and getting teachers. So yes, we had oh. the concern about our workforce, which, yeah. which is but, real, and a concern that, w that our children but, and our families were getting what they I, needed from those. I, I totally pick the point, and I think that's a very fair point, except the head teachers are your responsibilities, as are the teachers, and they were, they were to a man and a woman saying, why are you sending us all this guidance? Why didn't you reflect that back into the system where you've got that role to challenge all that? And I think those discussions did happen in the CFE management board, not only from ourselves, but from other partners. And um, so the discussion did happen. But okay, can I ask, uh, I take the point. Can I ask one other question? In the COSLA submission today, it says, and I quote, on attainment funding, as the attainment fund has grown, core funding for local government in 2016-17 has reduced. Do, does that mean that you've made a different argument before tomorrow's budget that will be presented to Parliament? Could you repeat the question? In your submission to this committee, uh -huh. it says, and I quote, as the attainment fund has grown, core funding for local government yeah. in 16, 17 has reduced. So yeah. therefore, have you, made a, an arg uh, have you made a different submission to the government in, re in respect of the budget that's going to be announced tomorrow? That's true. That's true. 
I think there, there's been ongoing discussion between COS and Scottish Government in relation to local authority budgets and to the education spend within that. Um, and I don't think we're, we're in a position to make a comment on that at the moment. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. Colin. Thank you, Vera. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, New Bartle Community High School for hosting me on Monday and for Midlothian Education Authority for facilitating that. Um, their input has been very useful certainly in my understanding here. And I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, or ask, ask a few questions about additional support needs. Um, clearly, um, mainstreaming of, uh, of uh, pupils has been broadly successful, but there are issues around that. And I'm looking at a figure here that says 22.5% of pupils are recorded as having additional support needs. And obviously that's probably a fairly wide spectrum, but it seems to be an, an, awful, lot of, uh, an awful lot of students. It's almost one in four. The, according to this also, something like 4.6% uh, of all students have what they call a coordinated support plan, which means that they have social, emotional and behavioural difficulties. How are schools coping with that? Are they, are they, are they managing to balance the mainstreaming of what can be very challenging pupils with... Uh, the needs of the other pupils, for example? I think that's, that's a very, very fair point. Um, we actually had this discussion last night, and I don't want to, to make it sort of obvious, but I dealt with an incident recently of whereby there was one young lad who had severe emotional and behavioural difficulties. His behaviour was at the point whereby it was causing potential harm to the rest of the pupils, so those pupils were actually taken out of the classroom. So I suppose you would talk about mainstreaming, which we agree with, but I suppose sometimes we still have to always revert back to GERFEC. You know, every child has the right to have that education. I think it's a very, very challenging issue. And it'll be no surprise I'm going to come back to budgets. You know, as well as I do, that our core teaching budget, uh, our teaching numbers are preserved, which means that when education conveners and, and uh, officers are having to look at their budget, then we have to take our fair share of that. So it means that we are losing ASN teachers, and you know, that, to me, you know, is, is, a, is a real challenge. You know, how do we actually keep looking after our most vulnerable children whilst having to cut back and cut back and cut back? So we do have real challenges there. Uh, spending on additional support for lending increased by £24 million, mm -hmm. so there was more money being made available. Mm -hmm. Don't look like yeah. uh -huh. I need to ask for a breakdown of that. I don't have that, that figure <coughs> broken down for me at the moment, but I'd be happy to come back with that. Okay. The, the other thing about, uh, about this is there is a statutory presumption that students will be educated in the mainstream, and there are some qualifications around that. For example, uh, if it's incompatible with the edu if it, education of the other children, or, or if there's a significant unreasonable public expenditure. Can you quantify, how, how do you reach the conclusion if it's unreasonable public expenditure or if it's having a, an unreasonable impact on other children's education? Um, I'm quite happy to, to take that. Certainly in Renfrewshire, we have quite a, a developed um, system which would include a multidisciplinary group looking at the needs of that child and can I say additional support needs is driven by the needs of the child and while we have a presumption of mainstreaming we do have a number of different um, facilities such as autistic spectrum um, disorder bases in primary and secondary and social emotional behavioural needs but we also have um, to support in mainstream, we also have a number of, of um, support systems there from, we have 200 additional support needs assistants, we have a home link team which go out and work with parents um, of children with special needs, we have a looked after children um, link team and of course a children's services inclusion team and psychological services. So. There are supports that the local authority centrally are able to assist schools in, in uh, um, keeping children in the mainstream. Um, and that's 
that's one of the things that in answer to the, the question about the government, governance review that local authorities do well, helping schools deal with very yeah. difficult situations often from that central resource in a way that is cost effective, not having one school dealing um, with perhaps, as, as, as we have, £72,000 in one school on two children. Would it be correct to say that uh, support is becoming more centralised in that regard? I mean, you referred, you referred to that somewhat yourself about all these other uh, areas that are supporting children with difficult needs or whatever. It's, it's not centralised as, as such. It is a central resource that is utilised in schools and that is done through agreement with the head teacher and the multidisciplinary team around the child if there is a multidisciplinary team. So the centre in a way is the resource and the developer of the service but it is utilised in schools. I think yeah, I don't yeah, know if you I want to add. That. You know, we hold central teams if you like but then they're deployed out to schools. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a strength, again, within local authorities, is that we wrap care around the child. So you know, if we do have a youngster who has ESN, then we have social work, we have home care involved, you know, we have ed sites, we have SLTs, and they, they are brought into to that specific child so that the child is seen at the centre, which, again, goes back to the point that I make every two seconds, is that GERFEC you know, operates at that level. And in actual fact, that support is only one phone, phone call away mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the school. The school does not have to go down mm -hmm. different agencies or different services arranging that themselves. It's a single point of contact. Uh, my, my discussions with Newbarrow Community High School indicated that extreme behaviour in the classrooms were incre was increasing. And uh, the, the school itself, of course, is located in an area of considerable deprivation. About uh, and I think about 69% of the sh of the sh of the pupils come from an area of deprivation. Now, this extreme behaviour they see is becoming more extreme, more more common, mm -hmm. and it's very disruptive, time-consuming for the teachers to deal with, and uh, there is an impact on learning from other pupils. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do you recognise the fact that this is becoming a, a more common problem? Well, I think, sorry, sorry, I, was just going to say that I think the answer is yes. I think that mm -hmm. in in discussions with teachers in primary and secondary school, we do recognise the challenge in the system around additional support uh, needs. Um, what Councillor Henry was saying a minute ago is that the central resource is is is, is a, attempting to meet the needs, and I think there's a number of reasons why those needs are increasing. Partly, there's uh, there's issues around diagnosis. There's also issues around the impact of poverty in particular areas, and that can also manifest itself in relation to parental mental health, substance misuse, and so on, that in turn has an impact on children. Um, I suppose the, the key point I wanted to make, following from Councillor Primrose, is that should we seek to devolve more to schools like New Battle, then they could be left holding all of that within the context of the school, the school management, the school community. And given some of the challenge uh, and some of the extreme challenge that you've heard about, uh, Mr Beattie, I think that that is a real concern that we have in the local government family. Should we devolve more responsibilities, particularly around additional support needs, to the unit of the school rather than trying to, to manage a very demanding agenda as you've outlined it, across a whole local authority area. And it is that wraparound team around the child mm -hmm. support system that is working despite the strains in the system currently. But even without the more disruptive uh, students, we're still talking about 22.5% of all children have additional support needs. That, that seems a very, very high proportion. And actually, the... the um, the number of unreported or unrecorded additional support needs is thought to be much higher. Mm -hmm. could, could I just add as well, I think you know, this is where, again, the role of early intervention comes mm -hmm. in. Uh, if we're looking at uh, the, the speech and language therapist, a statistic that hit my desk a couple months back was that in one particular area, 70% of children were not speech, speech ready. 
So at that point, they enter, it, they enter into education 10 to 18 months behind you know, those who are speech ready. So I think the earlier we access those children, and of course, yes, um, you know, various, it can be SLTs, it can be behavioural needs, it, it can be you know, severe to moderate uh, disabilities, if you like. So I think you know, when you're looking at people who have the, the behavioural things, we need to get in early. And if we get in early, you know, A, we help the child, which I think would be our, our ultimate goal. You know, we close that attainment gap. And then a, a consequence of that would be that your behaviour was better. Ross, you could... Yeah, just uh, off the, the back of uh, Colin Beattie's questions, it'd be interesting to know what role you'd hope to have in the review of the presumption of mainstreaming that should happen next year. But uh, Mr McLeod touched on the, the point I really wanted to ask about, about diagnosis. Mm -hmm. There are considerable inconsistencies in the uh, proportion of young people within local authorities who've been identified as having a, an additional support need. And Councillor Henry touched on the fact that there are huge numbers that probably have unidentified support needs. If we could if we look at uh, local authorities with very similar demographics, there can be anything as much as a 20% or more difference in identified additional support needs. Why do you think there is that level of inconsistency? Because it's surely not a genuine difference in the number of people with ASN. I'll make a brief point if that's going to be passed back, back to you, Jackie. I think you know, one of the ASN things that you, we, we need to examine is the amount of people coming through with additional support needs for language. So, for example, if you look at the big you know, inner cities in Glasgow and Edinburgh, Aberdeen sort of thing, do they'll have a higher proportion of people who have English as a, a need English as a second language? If you go further afield, you know, if I, again, look at my own authority, you know, the, the people that have that ESA need for languages is considerably lower. You know, of course, you know, all local authorities, as you know, are very, very signed up to the refugee crisis. But you know, with the refugee crisis does come that need for the, the ESN stuff. So I think that partly explains why there's a, there's a difference. Uh, Jackie, do you want to...? No, I, I would agree with that. The only thing that it, it made me think of... Um, both Mr McLeod and myself have referred to families first. And one of the cases, one of the things that we've learned from them is that children are often referred firstly about behaviour. Mm -hmm. And it's only once the team get to know the child that they find all sorts of other problems behind them. Um, some of which are related to poverty, some of which aren't. Um, so, yes, we're having, you know, for all the reasons that, that Councillor Primrose has, has mentioned about differences in, in the demographics of an authority, I think um, we are perhaps becoming better at, mm -hmm. at realising that children come from families and sometimes those, the tensions, dynamics within a family will have an impact on the child. And, and we need to address that. Yeah, just very yeah. briefly, because I, I think that one of the other areas is autistic spectrum disorder. And yeah. certainly there have been changes both in diagnostic process and perceptions around autistic spectrum disorder in the last 10 years. And that will have seen, uh, and I couldn't mm -hmm. quote you the figures, but I could find them and perhaps convene or supply them later to this committee, that if you look at the increase, uh, exponential increase year and year on the numbers of, of children with ASD, that in itself tells, I think, a story which is about partly variation, because clearly the diagnostic ability of the system quickly to respond to to concerns of that nature has been really tested. So I think there's a real issue there in that particular field alone. And that also means the partnership with the health service is critical in that yeah. regard. So one, I just wanted to add one thing. You asked a very specific question about whether local authorities would be part of the work going forward. We are a member of the advisory group on the additional support for learning, and we will be supporting Scottish Government as they look in, in this matter in the early new year. Thanks very much. And just uh, very briefly, going back to my uh, previous point around nursery teachers, do you think that lack of genuine access, contact time with a qualified nursery teacher would prove a barrier to the, the point uh, Councillor Primrose was making about early diagnosis and identification? I think it's just that we have to look at the, the new workforce that's coming in. You know, I, I think we do have to bear this in mind when we're looking at modern apprentices and things like that. I think that's why it's very critical that we have all partners on board. You know, we sit on... Yeah, yeah, what is it, the advisory group? Mm. The, the advisory group for, for early years and things like that. And, and you know, we raise that. That you know, 
not only with the modes of apprentices and people that are coming into early years, uh, but also your basic teacher induction. You know, I think increasingly you know, these things need to be built in, and you, we are certainly we are certainly in discussions with various people about that. I don't think it's a barrier. I think um, childcare practitioners liaise with uh, health professionals on issues to do with children's speech and language on a day and daily basis. I think teachers would come in with that with a particular skill in how they develop that and help to develop that with other colleagues like speech and language therapists and childhood practitioners. It would be a different discipline and a different look at it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just have one last question before we finish the session. You'll be delighted to know. <laughs> the, how would you spend the £100 million attainment fund? Oh, that's a lovely question for, for this time of day. Uh, I think I would have to accept the fact that although you know, a number of authorities, nine authorities, do have attainment challenge money, their attainment challenge schools, we have to recognise that there's poverty in all 32 local authorities. Uh, we have rural poverty, you know, we have poverty in all stretches. So I suppose we'd be looking to say, yes, £100 million is one for, I think I'd probably want more. Uh, to, to make sure that we're targeting you know, every local authority that does have poverty, uh, that does have children living in poverty. Uh, how to spend it? It would need to be across all services. You know, how would I allocate it? Um, I would ask a uh, head of service to do that. I don't think I would necessarily have the... <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't think I would necessarily just... How, say, how would you like to see it allocated across local authorities, but never mind within the local authority? I would like to see, uh, I'd like to see it uh, across all the services that actually go into schools. Uh, I'd like to see it in home care link workers. I think that's a critical role. And how, would you, how would you base how much of that £100 million goes to each authority? That would be a match for the distribution finance committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have I sidestepped that? I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, that, that beautifully. Be Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Councillor Henry. In terms of allocating it, all I would say I would hope that Renfrewshire gets its fair uh, <laughs> amount and that it recognises our, our, as a local our politician. population that <laughs> isn't recognised at, at the moment. Um, I think that's a, that's a real issue because um, we need to, to recognise deprivation, as you know, at the moment. Super sparsity has a greater uh, waiting in the way that the education budget is allocated than the deprivation does. And that is not to minimise the, the expense that rural authorities or authorities with large rural areas have. But I think deprivation and concentration mm. of deprivation is a major issue. We have schools in our authority where 96 per cent of children live in SIMD1. We have the poorest area in Scotland. So, therefore, um, you, you, so you, I think we need to look at deprivation. So you'd be quite supportive then of anything that uh, was targeting the funding on those schools that have got the greatest need of deprivation, you know, the, the greatest concept of des deprivation? I think we need to look at both universality and targeting, because there are poor children in every school in my authority, even those where they have 1% or less SIMD. So I think, I think there are two things. Teachers move, staff move. We need training of staff, regardless of where they are, so that they um, benefit children throughout their career. Um, and across authorities and across schools. So I think there's that. But I think there is an element of targeting, and certainly that is the approach that we have taken in our authority, both in our Tackling Poverty Commission that gave us £3 million, and um, in our plans for the attainment fund that we have at last had access to. OK. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, before we finish, then, there's just a, a couple of things I'd, I'd like to... Say one is that the committee will be light, uh, writing a letter to North Lanarkshire Council based on what uh, Councillor McGregor has said, and the other is that um, <laughs> Fulton McGregor, uh, and the other is that uh, the SLGP, if they could write to us and, and let us know what contact they've had with ministers about the, the earlier stuff that we were talking about earlier on. Okay.
In that case, thank you very much for your time and patience and for your responses. Thank you. And that closes the public session of the meeting.